right, doing a nice quick rundown of the POB for my Chain DD Necromancer League starter build. This is the uh, first time in I don't know how many leagues, but a very long time that I'm kind of just doing a already known established build as a league starter instead of toying with something new. Because the way this league sounds, you can't opt out of the league mechanic. There's these new T17 maps, a lot of stuff that like could be difficult. Um, I actually wanted to go to just something safe and that I know how to play and that I know is going to do really well. And Detonate Dead's a really obvious choice. Uh, some people are doing Ignite Detonate Dead, usually on an Elementalist. This one is Detonate Dead of Chain Reaction, which is hit-based and tends to be on Necromancer. That's the one I've done. I like the hit-based more. Um, and since I already kind of knew the build, it's established, everything's kind of known to a decent degree. Um, I went a bit harder on doing like a more in-depth POB. I have like a huge notes section and everything. Usually I just put the build together and let people figure it out themselves. But I think there's going to be a lot of people starting this build or very similar ones that maybe haven't played it before because they just know it's a strong starter. It's been proven in like hardcore SSF many, many times. Uh, that I thought was probably worth doing. Um, so first things first, I actually have multiple trees um we can switch to this this is like the very early stuff gear wise it only has map level stuff because pre-maps i don't think there was much point in putting gear and you just kind of put what you get on and you know you try to get your resists capped that's about it but so if we start off this is the pre-dd tree you can see it requires level 60 that's about when you'll be getting to probably act nine and uh, pretty soon getting ready to do your Merciless Lab runs because for Chain DD you are going to have to farm ideally Merciless Lab to uh, get the Transfigure Gem. So this is our starting build. Um, we have some like Dexterity stuff here for stat requirements. Otherwise we just have some Fire, Damage, Life, pretty simple stuff. Uh, I grabbed these Aura Nodes at round Act 4 to Act 5. And then... Late Act 5, Early Act 6, the mana for the Mana Mastery, and that'll let us run, while we're leveling, uh, Determination plus Haste, and then eventually also Defiance Banner and still have enough mana to cast. For the very, very, very early stuff, you can see the skills are in here, and the, the leveling process pre-maps is covered much more in-depth in the notes, but just a quick rundown. Prior to level 28, you're using Rolling Magma, that's your main damage. You have Flame Wall to boost it, you have Wave of Conviction for the uh, Exposure Debuff, Flame Ability, Holy Flame Totem. And uh, yeah, it's mostly just the Rolling Magma and then a bunch of Utility and Supplementary Damage stuff. As soon as you hit 28 and you kill Gravicious and you get that quest turn in, you swap to Armageddon Brand Cremation, which is like the standard caster leveling for a very, very, very long time. Um, you can see. You need to desecrate for your cremation for bosses. You can keep the flame wall since it works with cremation. You're getting yourself flame ability, wave of conviction. Initially, skitter bots plus Herald of Ash, but you're going to replace it later with the uh, Determination Haste. Mm -hmm. And this gets you basically all the way up to uh, Mercil's Lab, or gets you to maps or whatever. A um, couple gems that aren't in here in this bit, um, you'll probably want to get Shield Charge. I like getting it after I put haste on and around Act 5 or Act 6. Shield charge is just like a bit more mobility, and once you have haste, it doesn't feel super clunky to use it. And then also, if you have lots of extra red sockets, you can do cast and damage taken molten shell. But that's just dependent on socket availability, really, because this does get pretty tight on sockets for a campaign setup. And then early mapping, this is assuming you're getting your chain DD gem. Which, uh, ideally you want Vol Detonate Dead of Chain Reaction, but it's already a pain to get the first Chain DD gem. You could kind of save it for later if you really don't want to farm a ton. Um, so this right now just has a 5 link. It's got your Desecrate with faster casting. It's got your Bone Offering, Flame Ability, Wave of Conviction, and a Trigger Weapon. Got your Auras with Tempest Shield. I like running Bone Offering. You don't need to run Bone Offering. If you want to go fast, you can run Flesh Offering. But if you want to be Ultimate Safety, which to me is kind of the point of playing a build like this one as a starter, is that it's very, very tanky and very, very safe. 
Um, then Bone Offering works really well. And you can see with uh, basically just getting the maps and having no real investment, we still get to about 50-50 on block, which is, you know, it's not cap, but it's still pretty good. Um, have our shield charge, our castle damage taken, and our find blessing for haste so that we can go faster. And so this is the uh, early mapping tree you'll see from the leveling. A lot of it over here stays very similar. We redo this starting bit because the spell damage is no longer relevant because once you switch to DD, you're going to want to be doing most of your damage based off the corpse explosions, which doesn't scale with spell damage. And we need to get over here to get to like suppression, a little bit more aura stuff. We need EB. And then uh, we kind of just grab other useful things like Undertaker and the Shadow Life and whatnot. And this gets you up to yeah at least level 90 uh, pretty easily. And this is where you'll be just kind of cruising through map progression, presumably. You can see like the gear here. Um, at level 91, this POB right now has 5.7k life. And it says about 6 million DPS actually with the detonates ramped up. It might be a little bit off because the config is set up for the end game, not for this point. So there might be some extra ticks on. And also this is kind of assuming like for this to hit this full DPS, you basically need to use Arcanist brand for your desecrate, which you aren't really going to do unless you're actually fighting like hard bosses. So it'd be a little bit lower. It's probably closer to like three and a half, four million in maps. But for like early mapping, that's way more than enough, way more. And you'll see the gear's pretty, pretty basic. At this point, like Scepter's got just some damage and a trigger and some cast speed. Shield has life and a res. The helmet has a tiny bit of suppression, life and like a decent resist. Body armor's got life and one resist. Uh, gloves and boots, I think, are one res. Oh, no, the boots have no res, just life, move, speed, suppression. Amulet's got some dexterity. Dexterity is probably the one thing you need to look out for. Um... Oh, I have the wrong jewel in this one right now. I had a dexterity one, because again, the dexterity does get pretty tight. Rings, really, ideally, you want to get amethyst rings early in maps, mid-map progression, because just the chaos res implicit is really helpful. And then the only thing to really keep in mind other than that is like belt, we have this we generate 150 ES per second while a rare unique is nearby. May not be entirely necessary. It depends on how much you're spamming as bosses and things like that. But if you find yourself running out of ES at all, casting, spamming too fast, um, which should only happen against like bosses, uh, that's like the first thing to look at. Right, and so that'll get you presumably up through and like easily completing all your red tier maps up to T16s and everything. And then the final form of the POB, we have Endgame which is like a relatively high investment um, setup, which just means like crafted rares, better items. I put the Finds of Destiny in here just because it's a really good item, but it's not needed and it might be like really expensive this league. We don't know yet. But so you can see we've upgraded like... The Scepter doesn't actually change much. It just became multi-mod and has a way higher fire damage roll because there's not a ton on your weapon... It's hard to get, like, actually six useful stats without going super insane. Although this one now is an LE Overload Scepter. Because you can see on the tree, with this setup at least, I'm no longer pathing to Elemental Overload, because that's three points. Three points is worth more than the Scepter Implicit. But so the rares, we have things like the same shield as before, but now it has Suppression and it has extra Evasion ES. And the Helmet has extra life and a higher Suppression roll. The Body Armor is... Pretty much completely changed around the early mapping one. I put on an ES evasion chest. Because early on it's a little bit tougher to get as much ES as you need to maintain your costs. But once you get like better gear elsewhere. Ideally you want to be running armor evasion bases. So that's what this is. And it's got like high armor evasion. It's got high suppression. Um, gloves. Similar thing. It's the same as before. But added like chaos resist to them. And then we also have added the... Uh, Eater X arc implicits on these items. Um, I turned one ring into a vermilion ring just for some more life because if we get chaos res elsewhere, we can be capped without double amethyst. We have some big dexterity rolls on these rings because the dexterity is very tough to hit with this end game. 
setup. The one thing that could uh, pretty easily help it out would be a careful planning jewel. And this could go in at any point in time in the character progression if you're like really hurting for dexterity. Um, a careful planning jewel in this gem socket gives you about 60 dexterity. So that's um, a pretty big boost if you're really hurting for some more dexterity. And then the belt's pretty similar. I added like a hunter life roll to it. And then we've also added a militant faith and a cluster jewel. The militant faith, um, if you can get one with like useful mods, like I put 4% Ellie per 10 devotion on this one. It's not bad, right? We have 120 devotion, so we're getting about 48% Ellie damage. It's actually quite decent. Uh, but what's actually really important on this is the keystone. The power of purpose is like a very nice quality of life node. That's also pretty useful. So like if I turn off this granite flask, you can see we're at like 30k armor without our flask on. Um, this node is giving us about 5k armor. But also it's doing that by converting mana into armor, which means our Divine Blessing Haste, you can see that normally it would cost 600 ES. 600 mana cost becomes ES, right? So that's like a huge chunk of our ES. The cost goes down because we have less mana and it's based on our mana, right? So it makes it a lot easier to cast that and it gets rid of the need for linking the haste, divine blessing to an inspiration. So it saves a gem socket in addition to giving some armor and some damage. It's just really solid, like solid stat wise and very good quality of life. One thing to be careful with this is to make sure that um, it's not like converting notables. Militant Faith has a chance to convert notables. Like you can see this one. This is a converted notable. Because normally this is Vampirism, which gives some recover life on kill and recoup. It's getting converted. You don't want it to convert your Melding or your Undertaker nodes. Um, realistically, there's a chance like Undertaker could get converted into something that's randomly really, really good. And you actually like it, but it's probably not going to be the case. Um, and so with this, this is like, again, pretty decent investment endgame setup. But this, at this point, you're going to be very comfortably killing any non-Uber bosses. You're pretty much ready for Uber bosses even. Um, but you might want to like have some um, alterations ready for like, if you're running Exarch, you know, you can drop grace and run purity of fire which actually this league is going to be kind of awkward because they got rid of verici white sockets so i'm not sure how we're going to handle gem socket swapping as much we'll have to get white sockets some other way i guess um all right so like you can like the one advantage of this build this setup it's very flexible on swapping certain things around so like when you're doing your uber bosses it's pretty good to like get a handful ready and then do like a swap, like on Uber bosses, you want Rune Binder so that you can do Arcanist brand for your Desecrate, right? And I'm not going to go into super depth on like that type of endgame stuff with this. This is kind of just to cover the general mapping endgame. But point being at this point in gear, um, you should be plenty strong enough to take on those Uber bosses and also those like the new T17 maps and whatnot. So that's like the three main... Points of progression in the POB, you've got the pre-maps, you've got the mapping, you've got the higher investment endgame mapping. And you can see it's like, it's quite tanky. The max hits aren't super, super high. They're like, acceptable, but again, for like, non-Uber stuff, they're plenty high. And this is also a build that's capped spell block, almost capped block, with evasion and armor. And in this particular setup, Defiance to Destiny, like, you're not dying in maps with this, it's almost impossible. Um, to die in a map with this setup. Unless you get outright one shot by like an enemy DD or something. But otherwise you should be plenty good to go. So that's all the like basic POB stuff, right? So I've, I've kind of got like three builds in here as one. Um, but then I have this whole note section, which I'm going to very quickly try to cover if you uh, need some more help figuring things out as you go. Uh, at the top, you can see it's just kind of saying if you're looking at different versions of the build, like the end game versus the early mapping, you have to change it in the tree, the skills, and the items. That's very important. 
I also do have a setup with fourth vow in it. Right? End game fourth vow, end game fourth vow, end game fourth vow. Uh this was just looking to see what the numbers would be like on a fourth vow setup. Um Although I think I might have messed something up because the max hits are not as high as they're supposed to be. The Fizz hit's supposed to go down, but the Ellie max hit is supposed to go up. Oh, this doesn't have the, um... Correct jewel there. There we go. Yeah, okay, hold on. Oh, I was on the wrong tree. That's why. See. Well, now I gotta undo that. Either way, um, it was just to show that putting fourth vow in can improve your max hit by a pretty solid amount. At the cost of some Fizz Max it and um, some other quality of life from like having that militant faith, whatever. But I didn't put a ton of time into that one. It was just to show that it works. Uh, Spectre stuff about Spectre notes. Just had to get your Spectres going for Detonate Dead. And where some of the ones that people use now are from. And then we have basically leveling mini guide... Uh, kind of lists what gem sockets you'll need because the biggest thing progressing through Axe is actually just making sure you have items with the right sockets so you can put all your gems in. Especially as Necromancer because you can grab Commander of Darkness from your first lab for 30 all res. Like usually leveling gear wise you just need all res. You need your resists capped or you want them capped. And then like life rules which is easy. So like this it's very important to make sure you're getting your sockets. So it covers all the sockets. Uh, I tried to color code any point when we were showing new gems so you could kind of see, like, oh, there's a ton of blue gems you're going to need. It also lists out the exact gems that you need. Socket colors. Um, act by act by act. Uh, a little bit more campaign leveling notes, like things to keep in mind if you want to try to speed it up a bit. Like act one, you want that blue, blue, blue. Get your amber amulet early on. If you get an extra transmute so you can level up your flame totem. Um... Certain level checkpoints, you want to be like level 12 by Mervale, ideally, level 16 by Weaver, ideally, things like that. Act 3, you got your bench crafts getting ready, and they cost a lot of transmute, so you want to get those ready. A uh, little ascendancy thing, ascendancy order. You do want to get a detonate dead gem before you run lab, just in case you get lucky and you see the, like, turn a gem into the transfigured of the same gem. That would be very unfortunate if you found that and didn't have a DD gem on you. And then uh, this bottom bit is about like mapping notes, kind of like early mapping priorities for gear. There's not a lot to cover in early mapping because once you get DD, you kind of just playing the mapping game going. But um, I tried to quickly put together a list of like the order of stat priorities. It's not like a super hard like you have to do them in this order, but uh, just like what I could quickly think up of what I thought was like the important order to prioritize. Like, obviously, getting capped res and having your stat requirements is very important. Uh, and then I like getting to positive chaos res, getting some life, getting enough ES for EB so you can do your divine blessing. That's pretty big. Uh, then you start working on, like, getting some suppression, get a trigger weapon from betrayal, blah, 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 blah. Goes on and on and on. And then the end game build notes is kind of just to help you get set up to that, like, higher investment thing. Like the EO Scepter is good when you get a Cluster Jewel, Militant Faith, Dexterity is tough. Uh, you might need minus cost on rings, I'm not sure yet. We'll have to see if there's, I noted in a couple places about the mana cost. Like, um, Technically, if you look at the ES cost per second, it says 439. We don't sustain that, we do not get quite that much back. I think between Leech, ES Recharge, and the ES Regen on the belt, we can get like 400 ES per second, and then there's this much getting used at 60 corpses consumed recently. It could go higher, it could go lower. Like at 100 corpses maxed out, it's 500, you know. Um, and then you also have your weapon triggering stuff, which costs some ES. But 
you're not always going to be standing still spamming. It's going to be pretty rare that you're spamming long enough that you'll actually have an issue with it. But like I noted in the notes somewhere, one of the first things you could do if that's a problem is you can click this skills cost life instead of 30% mana. If this gets rid of 130 of the ES cost per second. At the cost of now you have to spend some life per second. I did note that like, you know, if you do click that, hopefully you have some leech from like a Doriani's Lesson Cluster Jewel to, you know, not feel the extra life cost because the life regen isn't particularly high. But you could. Um, and yeah, so there's things like that. So the notes cover a lot of that stuff. Hopefully, the kind of questions I could think of that people would be wondering and um, how to progress it and all that. And yeah, that's the build. Very safe starter. Um... Once you get the build going, relatively idiot-proof. Because it's just very tanky. And it does a lot of damage without a lot of damage investment. And... For, like, mapping in particular, which is what the vast majority of people are going to be spending almost all their time doing at, like, you know, week one end game is just clearing maps and stuff. The type of tankiness it provides between, like, having solid evasion, solid armor, block all that it's the type that's like very very good in maps in particular it's not the tankiest build ever for like uber bosses but for mapping it's fantastic and um yeah i think that covers basically the whole thing i think this is the most like comprehensive i've done for a pub because like i said usually i just put the build together and if people have questions about specifics, it's just free to ask. But I think this league in particular, there's a lot more value in having a bit more comprehensive because the way the league mechanic is set up where you can't opt out of it um, and a couple other things are going to lead people into looking for more established league starters. And uh, it seems like actually not that many people have actually played DD, even though it's been incredibly strong as a league starter for like I think three plus years now. So yeah, um, and the build is called DD for noobs because that's pretty much what it is. It's DD for noobs. Hope this video explanation was helpful, and if not, hopefully this massive list of notes and all the different build variations are helpful. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. See ya.